Well, good morning. Thank you for joining us. My name is Andrew Thompson. I'm the managing director of our wealth management division here at SCNH. And I'm thrilled you've decided to spend some time with us today as we explore some helpful and what we believe will be insightful year-end tax planning opportunities and considerations. Before we get started, let's review a couple of quick housekeeping items. All attendees will be muted during the webinar. The webinar will be recorded and shared with attendees, typically occurs a few days after this takes place. And we reserve some time for the conclusion of the presentation so that we can go through some questions that you may have. We've already received, I believe, 10 or 12 questions from, from the audience in advance of, of today. So if there's additional ones, please submit them throughout the presentation. We'll do everything we can to provide some answers. If we can't provide the answers during today's time, we will certainly be following up with those who submitted those questions the best we can. Okay, so today's agenda is gonna consist of really three primary topic areas, personal, business, and corporate tax planning. I mentioned earlier the polling questions that we're gonna have, so please ensure that you're paying attention at the end, because we've, we've, we have a couple of, of those uh, polling questions we wanna make sure we get to. So let's dive in. This is the time of year that mutual funds and some ETFs distribute the capital gains they've realized through trading activity earlier in the year. I talk about this every year at this event because this is such a, a it, in some cases, an easy piece to, to get right so that you can avoid some of these nasty uh, capital gain distributions. The funds themselves, the mutual funds, and in some cases, some ETFs, they cannot pay the tax on their own. They distribute the proportionate share to the shareholders who own the fund, and they're liable to pay it. Um, what we've seen so far on distribution estimates, even Vanguard funds, which historically don't tend to pay out much in the way of capital gains, they tend to be very tax efficient. We've seen some of them projecting above 3%, which means if you own $100,000 in, in a fund, you may be subject to a $3,000 capital gain distribution. And if you're in, call it the 30 or 40% combined tax rate, you're giving up almost half of that and you haven't received anything. It's just a, a distribution that's fully taxable. So it's not adding to your position. It's taking away from whatever return you had for the year. Uh, on many of the actively managed funds out there, those tend to be, to, to have, it's not uncommon to see a year in distribution at 10%. 15%. In some cases, we've seen that a lot. This year, asset values have risen. Now, last year, asset values were down. So there may be some losses that will offset the gains in some of those portfolios this year. So I wouldn't expect to see too many in the 10 to 15% range, but be cognizant of what is owned in either your portfolio or your client's portfolio and um, determine if it may make sense to exit that position in advance of the distribution, which is likely to occur over the coming weeks. So we wanna balance that near-term cost of exiting something that might be tax inefficient with some of the longer-term benefits that may result when you don't have any future distributions because many funds do not have year-end distributions. So consider that what that break-even point might be. If it's maybe in some cases less than three years, it probably makes sense to consider paying a little bit of tax now when selling the position, incurring some gain, and knowing that you're avoiding this year's distribution and any future year distribution. So take a look at what the impact of that might be, and it may save you some, some dollars in the future. Um, also, if you're expecting to be in a higher tax bracket next year, consider realizing some gains this year. If you're in a lower tax bracket next year, maybe consider waiting until January to sell it. Uh, when you get the proceeds, perhaps investing in something that's a little more tax efficient. Again, ETFs, I mentioned those earlier, those tend to be highly, highly tax efficient. Their structure's a little bit different and they're able to, in many cases, avoid having to pay out any of those, those nasty taxable distributions to, 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 to their shareholders. 
Uh, another item to keep in mind before, and let's go back to the last slide. Um, another thing to keep in mind before the end of the year, if you have positions in your account that are valued below your cost basis, in other words, what you paid for it, consider selling it to realize the loss for this year and buy something similar. So if you have an S&P 500 index fund sold by iShares or Black, BlackRock or Vanguard, you could sell it and you could buy the Fidelity S&P 500 fund. In 31 days, which is the time period you have to wait before going back into the old position, you sell what you bought as a replacement so that you didn't miss out on any subsequent increase and you can buy back into what you had sold. So at the end of the day, you still own what you originally owned, but you unlocked a tax deduction to unlock that tax loss. And those tax losses, that capital loss can be used to offset any capital gains that you might have you might had elsewhere. And if you maximized all of those capital gains with the losses, you can deduct up to $3,000 of ordinary income. And then any unused portion, if it was a big loss uh, outside of your capital gains, you carry that forward into future years to offset any future capital gains. If you don't have any future capital gains, you can continue to deduct $3,000 a year until it's fully used. So that's a, that's a very common strategy that we employ when we see time periods of temporary volatility in the market. As we go in, we, we're, we're going to be proactive and look for maybe new positions that we just bought. If they drop by 10%, we'll sell it, buy something else the same day, wait 31 days in some cases, sell the new position, buy back the old position. The end result, a couple of trades that we put through, but we can save thousands and thousands of dollars from a tax standpoint for, for clients. If you own bond mutual funds, so bonds, as interest rates have risen over the last year and a half, bond prices have fallen significantly. They've come back a little bit over the last month, but they may be uh, an extraordinary opportunity to, to sell out of, capture that loss. Um, furthermore, the if you're owning a bond mutual fund um, or, or a bond in general outside of a tax sheltered account, like an IRA or a 401k, consult with your financial advisor or your tax professional, um, it may be better, you may be better served to own that in a tax sheltered account. So you're not subject to all of the ordinary income tax that comes with the bond interest that you receive. Let's take a look at the next slide. Higher yields equal higher tax liability. So let's plan accordingly. Let's talk about that. So you should be earning about 5% with any of your excess cash outside of say, checking your savings accounts. So if you have cash that you're not using, the, the going rate for most money markets is right around 5%, a little north of that, depending on the type of money market that you own. It's nice to have the higher interest these days, but consider what the tax impact of that is. And this is gonna be a surprise, I think, for a lot of people, they hadn't considered that. So all income received is taxable at ordinary income tax rates, as many of you they know. And therefore, if you're in, say, the 37% federal bracket, which is the highest bracket this year, and say the 8% state tax bracket, you're only going to net about half of that interest after taxes, about 55 cents on the dollar. So this also doesn't include, by the way, the, the nasty Obamacare tax, otherwise known as net investment income tax of 3.8%. On top of that, so we really want to consider other types of money market options that may be more optimal for you. An example of that might be a municipal money market account. A municipal money market fund on an after-tax basis, if you're in one of those higher tax brackets, say 35% or above, or if you're in a high, high tax state like California, New York, Connecticut, a lot of the Northeast states, including Maryland, a municipal money market might be more appropriate for you. So take a look at what the tax equivalent yield on that might be. So keep in mind, it's nice to have some extra interest these days, but we're only seeing higher rates because we have higher inflation. And unfortunately, that means on a real basis, when, when we consider inflation, and then we consider taxes, you're probably earning a negative rate of return on that 
that cash. I hate to be Debbie Downer there, but uh, that is the unfortunate reality here. So uh, let's plan accordingly for for what your year to date year to date interest has been, and look for ways to mitigate that through the use of things like uh, municipal money markets. Let's take a look at the next slide. One of the surprising, and this is a really interesting um, strategy that, that we can talk about here with respect to 529s, one of the surprising provisions of the SECURE Act 2.0 is the ability of certain 529 owners to transfer up to $35,000 to the beneficiary's Roth IRA. And so effective in 2024, the owner of a 529 college savings account, provided they've owned the account for at least 15 years. So they opened it 15 years ago, back in say 2009 or before, they may transfer up to $7,000 to the beneficiaries of Roth IRA account, provided that the beneficiary has at least $7,000 in earned income for that year. So let's think about, you have a, a child who's not a child anymore if they're say 21 years old, You've had the account for 15 years and they may not need all of it for school. And they're working, maybe they have $10,000 of earned income. This could be a tremendous opportunity to move some money into a retirement account for them. So even if you weren't confident that you had a need for a 529 account, this rule makes a strong case to still open an account and fund it with $35,000 or maybe even 30 because you think it's gonna grow to 35,000. And during those 15 years, that 35,000 is growing tax-free. And ultimately, if it does end up in the Roth IRA, under current law, it'll grow tax-free for the life of the owner of that Roth IRA, including any future tax, uh, including any future distributions. So to take it a step further, the Roth IRA owner may distribute the contributions tax and penalty free, which means that the parent can effectively shelter 35,000 for their child for 30, for 15 years. When the child is say 30 years old and buying their first home, they may distribute that $35,000 tax and penalty free. Only the growth in a Roth IRA is taxable and subject to, to penalties if it's distributed before 59 and a half. Contributions are not subject to penalty or taxes. So what you've put into it. Now, that's not ideal for somebody who's saving for retirement, but it's a consideration or a planning opportunity, uh, nonetheless. Um, some states, such as Maryland, offer a modest deduction on contributions to the Maryland 529 investment plan. It's up to $2,500 per beneficiary for a maximum of, of $5,000. So husband, wife, married, following joint can deduct $5,000 on their Maryland return. It's a, it's a tax benefit of about $400 to you. Every little bit counts. One additional thing to keep in mind with respect to the 529s is that the first, in the first version of the, of the SECURE Act, it added a provision that allows parents to distribute up to $10,000 a year for K through 12 education, which furthers the, or further limits, I should say, the risk of overfunding a 529 account. So let's think about this for a second. If you have somebody who is entering high school, you have a high schooler, it's a private school, and there's what you believe more than enough money in that 529 account, or perhaps you have other resources in other accounts that could be used for college, maybe a, an investment account, or you have a rental property that you might sell or have income from it. You can take... $10,000 a year for those four years of high school, in this example, it's $40,000. And remember, on top of that, you can transfer another $35,000 to a Roth IRA for them, provided that account has been open to, for, for 15 years. And so there's some other little stipulations as well. So that's $75,000 right there that we know is not going to be subject to premature withdrawal penalties or subject to... to uh, penalties and, and income tax uh, for being for not being if you're not able to use it for for educational purposes. So again, for a lot of people who may have been a little bit leery in using a five two nine in the past, uh, if you have a, a child in, in private school, or if there's a a good chance that funding a Roth IRA 
makes sense for you or ultimately for them, uh, a great way to shelter some income uh, and, and, and uh, give them a head start with retirement savings. Take a look at the next slide. Talk a little bit about retirement plan considerations. So we're gonna shift gears a bit here. Um, this, this has to do with small business owners and, and certain highly compensated partners uh, in particular. If you are self-employed or you're highly compensated, there may be some very attractive ways to cut your tax bill while putting money away from retirement. So I'm gonna break this up into two pieces here then combine it at the end. For those that are self-employed, 1099 income and no employees other than their spouse, solo K, solo 401k, individual 401k, there's a lot of different names for it, uh, is practically a no-brainer. It allows you and your spouse, if they're in the business as well, to very easily open a retirement account. Sometimes that can be a, a headache, but these are very easy to open. And it allows you to deduct up to $30,000 as the employee and then another up to 25% of your net income for a total deduction into the solo K of $73,500. Now, you, you want to set up the account if this is something that's interesting to you, at least for 2023 anyway, you want to get the account before the end of this year. It doesn't take that long to open so that you can fund the employee portion, which is going to be due. It's, a, it's calendar year based. And then you have until your tax filing deadline to figure out how much net income you have for the business to put in any additional amount up to that 73.5. Now, separate from this, but these do kind of go together, and you may be eligible to, to fund what's called a cash balance plan. This is a type of defined benefit plan overseen by the DOL. So it is a qualified plan. There's some additional rules here. Uh, this can be, there are some costs associated to open this up, um, but it, it can be worth it for, for certain business owners. This allows you to, to defer or deduct against business income up to $265,000. That's in addition to the 73.5 you could put into that solo 401k. So you can do both. There are a lot of different eligibility requirements. It's age dependent. So to get that 265, you can't be 30 years old. It's, it's age-based. The older you are, the more you can put in there. And obviously you need to have the income to be able to handle that, you need to have the business income for that. But if, if the business is, is uh, seeing income well above say a half a million dollars, and in some cases even lower, it depends on your cash flow needs. This may be a really, really uh, powerful tool. We've done this uh, quite a number of times for, for our clients this year, and it has worked wonderfully. There are, again, a couple of headaches in getting it set up, but if you're working with a qualified team, then, they can make it very easy for you. Let's take a look at the next slide. Let's talk a little bit about inherited IRAs because this has been a very confusing landscape for a couple of years because there wasn't really much guidance from the IRS uh, for, for beneficiaries in terms of what they were able to do or what they could do or what they couldn't do. So the rules for those who inherited an IRA, really the, the only impact here is for non-spousal beneficiaries. If you're a spouse and your, your, your spouse passed away, you can just merge the retirement account into your own retirement account. And then you take distributions out based on your life expectancy. Pretty simple. But for non-spouses, the rules on annual distributions became a lot more strict under the first SECURE Act, which, and this is for effective for 2020, requires those inheritors of the retirement account to fully distribute the account within 10 years following the year of death. That means if the owner passed away in 2020, you, the beneficiary would have to fully distribute it by the year 2031. Up until recently, it was very, the IRS was unclear on whether or not that meant you could take equal annual distributions, whether you had to take anything each year and then distribute it all in the 10th year there, there, there was a, a, a lot of conflicting information out there, but, but they have been clear now that annual distributions are required and the inheritor must distribute at least a tenth of that account each year. In most cases, there's some exceptions based on how close in age you were to the 
to the decedent, but for the most part, it's about a tenth that needs to come out each year and have it fully distributed by the end. So depending on your situation, it may make sense to accelerate distributions for some part of that 10 year period. Let's think of an example here. If your income is expected to be considerably higher, maybe three or five years from now, you may wanna take more from that account than, than is required. The IRS will always take, take your, your tax payments uh, in advance. So you may want to accelerate some of the distributions now because you know your income is going to be higher. And in three to five years, your distributions that are much less, which means your taxable income is much less. And of course, the opposite is true. If your income is expected to drop in a couple of years, whether temporarily or, temporarily or full time, you may want to just take the minimum for a couple of years when your income drops, take as much as you can to stay in some of the lower tax brackets. So there's quite a bit of planning depending on your situation that's involved here. We've, we've encountered a couple of really, really interesting complex scenarios that, that take some careful planning. But again, with the right team in place, can alleviate a lot of the headaches either for yourself or for your clients. So something to, to, to keep in mind. So that wraps up some of, of my items here. I'm going to, I'm going to end with a polling question. Here's the first one. Up to how much may the owner of a 529 transfer to the beneficiary's Roth IRA provided they've satisfied the requirements? How much can they transfer to the Benny's Roth IRA provided they've satisfied the requirements? Okay. Now, I'm not sure, if, frankly, if I'm supposed to give away the answer or not, but there's been enough time here. So if you said 35,000, you are correct. So way to go. 86% of the participants got that right. Thank you for paying attention. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our next panelist, Brian Payne, and he's going to be talking through some additional individual tax planning and considerations as we go into the new year. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I am Brian Payne. I work with Andrew over on the wealth management team. While Andrew focuses on personal financial planning, I focus on taxation. So what we want to talk about today are a couple tax strategies to make sure that we're maximizing the tax benefit of your charitable donations. Okay. Um, we have a lot of clients who are very generous with their charitable giving, and we really want to make sure that we're maximizing the tax benefit that they should receive for that generosity. Um, a lot of times when I talk to clients or prospects about their charitable giving, I get, I get a response that goes something like this. You know, Brian, I, uh, I really don't give money to charity for the tax deduction, right? I do it because it's the right thing to do. I do it because I believe in the charity's mission. I do it because it's a part of my tithe, something like that. And while I understand that perspective, I really think it's important that we can maximize the tax benefit and structure these donations in a way that is really maximizing the amount of money that you get to keep at home with you. Um, and by doing so, you have more money to achieve your other financial goals or to increase your charitable giving budget for the following year. Uh, so the first tax strategy I want to talk about is something called a Qualified Charitable Donation, or a QCD. Um, leave it up to the IRS to come up with the most bland, nondescript description for um, a tax strategy, right? But basically what these are, are a charitable donation made by a taxpayer, but paid directly from their IRA, okay? Directly from the IRA to the charity. So the biggest caveat with these is that only taxpayers over the age of 70 and a half are eligible to make these. Um, as, as you folks probably know, if you're approaching that age, you are required to take required minimum distributions at the age of 72. So you're actually able to make a QCD or a qualified charitable donation for a year or two before you're required to start taking distributions from your IRA account. Um, under a QCD, taxpayer never touches the cash, okay? They coordinate this with the administrator of their IRA to make sure that money goes directly to the charity. 
it does, a QCD is only eligible to be made from an IRA, okay? You can't do this from a 401k, you can't do this from a 403b. There are instances that you can do these from a SEP or a simple IRA. I just encourage you, if you have a SEP or a simple and you're thinking about doing this, talk to your, talk to your tax advisor because there's a couple um, additional hoops that we need to jump through if you have a SEP or a simple account, okay? The biggest benefit of doing this is that you get a deduction for your charitable donation without having to itemize your deductions. So in other words, your RMD or the cash that you received from your IRA will not be included in your income whatsoever. It will not affect your AGI, whether or not you itemize your deductions. Um, just a quick note, the maximum amount of QCD that you can do in one year is $100,000 per person. Um, keep in mind, that's not $200,000 combined for a married couple. It is $100,000 each, okay? These have come become really popular over the last six or seven years, I'd say, because a lot less taxpayers are itemizing their deductions now, okay? Back in 2017, then President Trump passed the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And what that did was it combined the old standard deduction number and the personal exemptions that you got on your tax returns pre-2017 into one figure. And it also limited the amount of state and local taxes that you can deduct and take an itemized deduction for at $10,000. So what that did was a lot, a lot, a lot less of our clients are itemizing their deductions now. And if you make this donation via a QCD, instead of writing a check out of your personal checking account, it doesn't matter, matter whether you're itemizing your deductions or not, you will receive a, de a deduction for the charitable donation, okay? Couple more notes here. A QCD, Qualified Charitable Donation, can satisfy your RMD requirements, okay? So once you hit 72, you have to take a certain amount of uh, amount out of your IRA based on your IRA account balance and your age. These QCDs can satisfy that requirement. From um, an administrative perspective, it's kind of nice because you don't have to cut a check. You, know? you don't have to worry about whether your check to the church or to the food bank got lost in the mail. You don't have to worry about whether you forgot to cut a check before the end of the year. The IRA, the IRA administrator will send the funds directly to the charity. Okay. You don't have to pick one charity. You can spread your giving around. You can give a little bit of money to the church, a little bit of money to the food bank, a little bit of money to the your favorite cancer research fund. Wherever you want it to go, you can pick multiple charities. Okay. Um, like I said, we're just verifying that we're going to get a hundred percent deduction for your charitable giving by doing so. The other indirect benefit of a QCD is that that income never hits your adjusted gross income. And the higher your adjusted gross income is, um, there could be some negative benefits, like you can be phased out of tax credits, you can be subject to additional taxes. Um, if, if, you're, if your income is, is somewhat, um, if your income isn't real high, the QCD may even make less of your social security income taxable, okay? So keeping this, the, these funds that are going to charity out of your adjusted gross income can have a lot of indirect benefits. Okay, so a quick scenario here. Let's say you and your spouse are making a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, but you're you're taking the standard deduction and you give, let's say, fifteen thousand dollars a year to charity. You're in the thirty percent marginal tax bracket. If you're taking the standard deduction, even with those donations, you would get no tax benefit if you just wrote a check out of your personal checking account to the charity. If you do it via QCD that $15,000 will be excluded from your income and you'll get a 30% tax benefit out of it. You'll save about $4,500 by structuring this donation through a QCD instead of just writing a check, okay? So another strategy I wanna talk about today is something called the donation of appreciated stock, okay? And this one is kind of what it sounds like, right? This is for taxpayers who have stock in their portfolio that has significant um, unrealized capital gains. In other words, it's appreciated in value since it was purchased. Okay? 
The nice part about this, uh, this strategy, it's an option for taxpayers of any age. It's not subject to people 70 and a half like the QCD was. Uh, the higher the capital gains in your portfolio, the more a tax efficient, the bigger the tax benefit can be here. In order to qualify, you must have owned the stock for one year. In other words, it, it has to be long term. Okay. Um, this, this, you can really maximize the benefit if you are itemizing your deductions on the 1040. Even if you're not itemizing, there's still some benefit here. So don't rule it out whether you're itemizing or taking the standard deduction. Unlike the QCD, there's no hard dollar limitation. The limitation is actually 30% of your adjusted gross income. And even if you um, go over that 30% threshold, whether on purpose or by accident, you can actually roll forward any uh, amount that was disallowed to the to the following tax year. Okay, So under this provision, under this strategy, you'll really want to be talking to your financial advisor before the end of the year. This is not something that you decide to do on December 30th. Right, it's Friday, December 30th at four o'clock and I'm gonna call my advisor and get this done. This is something you wanna to talk to your advisor and likely the, the charitable organization about ahead of time just so that logistically everything can, um, can get accomplished. And the real benefit here is twofold. First of all, any unrealized capital gains that you have, you will not pay capital gains tax on that. So if you were to sell this stock, and then turn around the next day and cut a check to charity, you would have to set aside somewhere between 15 and 23.8% just to cover the federal taxes on the capital gains, okay? Under this donation of appreciated stock, you do not have to pay capital gains tax. The second benefit is that you get a charitable deduction for the full market value, not the basis, not what you paid for the stock, but the full market value of that stock the day that you donate it to charity. So if we could go to the next slide. I do have a quick scenario here just so you can, you folks can kind of uh, see how this works. So under our scenario, our taxpayer, our client donates stock that they've held for over one year. It's long-term in their portfolio. They paid $10,000 for this stock and over the years it's appreciated and now it's worth $50,000, okay? so. The taxpayer has a $40,000 capital gain if they sell this stock, right? Under our scenario, that $50,000 of stock was donated to charity. Our client does not have to include that $40,000 in long-term capital gains in their adjusted gross income. So if we do the math here, right, you're going to pay somewhere between 15 and 23.8% tax on that $40,000 if, if you cash it out personally. That equates to oh, something like 6,000 or 9,500 bucks in tax if you were to sell the stock and take the proceeds personally, right? If you donate it to charity, not only do you avoid the capital gains tax, but you also get a $50,000 um, charitable deduction on Schedule A, the full market value of the stock the, uh, the day that you donate it to charity, okay? And just so you folks know, Normally what happens here is the charity receives the stock, okay? They do not have any capital gains. You're not shifting any tax burden to the charity. What happens normally is the charity is not in the business of uh, trading stocks. So they will sell the stock immediately, turn it into liquid cash. Now the charity's got $50,000 of liquid cash that they can do what they see fit with it. So uh, just to kind of wrap up here, you know, if you're giving significant amounts to charity, just ask your financial advisor, am I getting a deduction for all these donations or am I being limited um, by the standard deduction level? And if you are being limited, if you're not getting a deduction for all of your charity, let's think about some of these other strategies that we can take. I just hit on two of them today, but there, there's other strategies that are out there as well. Just for the sake of time, we couldn't hit on all of them. But just be having this conversation with your tax advisor and make sure that you're getting the maximum tax benefit for uh, your charitable giving. Thank you. Oh, one more, one more poll question. At what age are you eligible to make a qualified charitable donation from an IRA? One more time. At what age are you eligible to make a QCD from your IRA?
67, 66% of you folks got it right. 70 and a half is correct. The folks that, that entered 72, that's when you're required to start making your required minimum distributions. Thanks, folks. Well, thanks so much, Brian. Um, I'm James, and I'm going to talk about uh, the first sort of tranche of business planning. Dan Gartrell, my colleague Dan and I, will talk about some business tax planning. We're going to split that up in two sections. Um, so <clears throat> the things that I want to talk about are limited tax law changes between 2022 and 2023, our glide path to 2025. That'll make more sense in a minute. And um, the PTE, PTEP and other standard strategies, the things that have become normal over the past uh, five or seven years. And lastly, just a quick uh, sort of uh, round table on if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. So let's take a look at um, limited changes year over year. What were changes compared to last year, compared to 2022? So there are really no fundamental changes in the tax code um, from 2022 to 2023. A few things that do sort of crop up are bonus depreciation. That's um, accelerated depreciation on fixed asset purchases for businesses um, are limited to 80% of acquisition cost. The last few years, it's been 100% um, accelerated depreciation. So that's a not especially taxpayer friendly um, uh, change. And that actually continues to decrease between now and 2025. Uh, in the 2024 year, that bonus depreciation will actually be limited to 60% uh, first year cost recovery. Please note that that's different than the 179, the IRC section 179 rules, which are still applicable for acquisitions up to roughly $2 million. Another item that, uh, well, we have a little bit more clarity on today than we had the last time we were together, and that's uh, research and development expenditures. Um, we call those IRC section 174 uh, R&D expenditures. Um, for many years, uh, businesses that invested in increasing research and development costs um, got a tax credit, and it was some certain percentage of expenditures. Um, <clears throat> and it was great because we also, the businesses also got to deduct those expenses. So if you had a million dollars of research and development expenditures, you got a million dollar deduction, and you also got maybe a fifty or $60,000 federal tax credit. It's great. Um, the tax code had a kind of poison pill in it and said, hey, starting in, in tax year 2022, you'll actually have to capitalize that, in my example, million dollars of expenditures to get that a 50 or $60,000 credit. And so what that meant was people were picking up a whole lot more taxable income and getting a relatively small credit. And so for years we set up, but the tax code, everybody in Washington agrees that's bad policy. That'll be updated. Uh, but it wasn't. And we had actually clients holding on until this summer to say, well, maybe they'll pass something which was discussed, but it never happened. Where we stand today in December of 2023 is that that was a law for 2022. It's been the law all of 2023. And there does not appear to be an appetite in Congress in Washington uh, to change that. So this is the, the, the sort of new uh, lay of the land or law of the land. This is what we anticipate. So again, this falls into the category of not a whole lot different than last year, but it is an area where we can concentrate and say, hey, Let's clarify. Last year, we were really holding our fingers and we, we had a number of models where we compared things. This year, it really looks like the R&D expenditures, research and development expenditures, will be capitalized and amortized rather than deducted. So if we take a look at, OK, if there hasn't been a lot of change between 22 and 23, when might there be change? Well, as tax folks, we always sort of live in a time warp. And oftentimes we're looking backwards. In this case, we're looking forwards. The TCJA, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, which was implemented, passed late in 2017, implemented January 1st, um, 2018, sorry, 2018, uh, runs through the end of 2025. And here we are in December of 2023, and we are actually having more and more conversations with our clients about, well, it's the end of 2023, and we're projecting out maybe mid-year 2024, there's a presidential election coming along. How, how long can I use the tax code the way that it is? And what will happen at the end of 2025? Uh, only really two tax years away. And so without uh, any congressional action, 
the tax code would revert as of 1231-2025, the tax code would revert to the old tax code, the way that it was in 2017 and prior. So you'd have things that we would have to consider like the alternative minimum tax and um, state and local tax deductions and a whole bunch of other uh, NOL considerations and a few other things. And so people are starting to make plans around at least having an optionality in 2025. If it looks like the tax code will revert, I'm going to implement one set of structuring or changes, right? And if it doesn't look like, or if Congress looks like they've passed something, then we'll, we'll play by those rules as we come along. If on that guide path, glide path to 2025, we say, okay, the tax code is going to revert. One of the more compl uh, sorry, complex things that we've dealt with over the past few years was the uh, SALT deduction workarounds, the so-called PTET or PTE deductions, which allowed companies to deduct the owner's um, state tax payments at the company level. Um, the general feel is that that's not going to go away, right? That genie has sort of been let up, left out of the let out of the bottle, and business owners and states have realized that this is a way of helping um, states support their um, taxpayers. So even if the the law were to change change and the state and local tax deduction would be uh, available starting in 2026. Um, this deduction, the PTE deduction, is a trader business deduction. It's not subject to itemized deduction rules. It's not subject to the alternative minimum tax. So that's we we do think that this uh, level of planning will continue. We're also seeing long term planning for um, a lot of clients. Right, folks are really looking at this and saying, "Gosh, Congress is having a hard time passing new uh, and intuitive laws. What's one major thing that might change as of December thirty first, twenty twenty five?" Well, the estate tax exemption would go from right now it's about $13 million per person or $26 million for a married couple back to roughly $5 million per person, $10 million for a married couple. And in the past five to seven years, there's been a lot of growth in private business valuations. And so people are looking at things like SLAT, that's um, spousal limited access trusts, um, get, getting those plans together and saying, hey, we're not going to implement them now, but we're going to be prepared as we pr approach 2025 to implement these sort of um, more advanced estate planning structures. Let's flip to the next slide, slide for a moment, and let's just look at um, when we talk about PTE or PTET and that SALT deduction workaround. This is a great um, um, visual that the AICPA, our national body, uh, presents and they they updated. You see, this one was updated in November twelfth, so they updated pretty frequently. The blue states are states that have that PTE salt tax workaround, broadly categorized as most states. The yellow states are states that are working on it, and the gray states are states that don't have or have some kind of limited income tax. So really, you're down to just one or two states that don't have a PTE workaround, um, in as much as states that have have a tax. Um, so. We really think that's likely to stay around. Let's take one look at the next slide. Um, again, we've talked about what is the PT, what's the SALT deduction. Most states have these provisions. It's great for smaller and local and domestic businesses. It's harder if you have a very diverse ownership group. Um, generally, we try to have clients pay a year's state um, PTE payment before year end so that we can perfect a deduction in the current year, in 2023. There is some ambiguity as to accrual basis taxpayers and whether or not they can accrue and pay later in the year. Um, that's a little bit nuanced in facts and circumstances. Um, keep an eye out for some states actually have a December 15th due date for that. Uh, and some states have a non-revocable election. So a little bit of technical items there, just things to keep your eye. And lastly, we want to talk about, um, right. Uh, non-income tax considerations. So the Maryland Saves Program is one that applies to many of our clients here in Maryland. It's a, a, a law that was passed some five years ago, but requires an online registration for uh, to, to either exempt or to set up a retirement plan for um, small companies. And another one, and I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on this because Dan's going to tell us about it, but the Corporate Transparency Act um, is a new, again, informational filing that's required at the federal level. Um, and while I have some notes there, they were actually updated just last week. So they just released some new information. Um, so we'll let Dan talk about that. Uh, lastly, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. 
Um, there have been a lot of talk over the past few years about the employee retention credit. Just in the fall, the IRS sort of came to the conclusion that um, not every application was wrong or was unjust or was fraudulent or bad or anything else, but a lot of them were. So they actually put a moratorium on processing new um, credit applications. Uh, and there's, well, there's a first round of folks who are getting, you know, like subpoenas and bad things like that, um, as far as what are being referred to as ERC mills. These are the folks that you hear on the radio, and maybe they're cold calling your business and saying, hey, um, we can get you X dollars of refund back. Just let us, you know, come in and do that. Um, so something to keep your eye on. If you're entitled to it, absolutely take it. But keep your eye on if, if it sounds too good to be true, probably is. Um, since the IRS has actually put a little bit of a, a clamp down on the ERC structures. Um, we've seen a few of the same websites, the same cold calls, the same radio ads, talking about some some other structures. So the preventative care maintenance programs, preventative care management programs, um, are something that was really uh, talked about in a series of um, IRS notices over the past 10 or 15 years. Um, and they can work, but normally they're purported to give a, a tax deductible benefit to both the company and the employee. And the IRS has essentially said, we don't believe you can do that without um, not doing the forms correctly. Um, so it seems like maybe if you're getting calls about these and you've got the, the, the same folks you were talking to about ERC and now they're, they're offering you this program, this might be a, a little bit of a bridge too far or an aggressive position. Um, so keep your eye out and call your, your advisor if you have questions. So before I hand it off to Dan, let's take a look at a polling question. Okay, what percentage of acquisition costs are eligible for bonus depreciation for tax year 2023. Again, in 2023, what percentage of acquisition costs are eligible for bonus depreciation? Hey, great job. 69% of folks got the right answer. Wonderful, good job. And Dan, why don't you take it over and talk to us about um, CTA and a few other business uh, topics? Thank you, James, and hello all. I am uh, Dan Gartrell, and I work with James and a host of other folks in SCNH's business tax department. Today, I'm going to be speaking on a few of my favorite tax topics and items you might want to review as we approach the close of 2023, and one big new topic um, for 2024. Starting with interest expenses, we actually are now in an era where um, people are uh, getting interest income and having to pay more in interest expense. The 163J um, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act limitation on the deduction of your interest has a bit more bite than maybe it had previously. Um, it is now 30% of adjusted taxable income, and it's based on EBIT versus EBITDA. Um, so your uh, universe for deducting it or the income that you can deduct it on is actually shrunk because you're not getting to add back your depreciation and amortization. So some of our clients that have a lot of depreciation, a lot of research uh, expense, expenses that they're capitalizing and amortizing, um, this might be something that really needs to be kept an eye on and uh, your deduction for interest can be a lot more limited maybe than you thought it uh, could be. Uh, this 30% uh, of adjusted taxable income started in 2022. There is a Build It in America Act, uh, H.R. 3938, which went into committee uh, June 30th of 2023, that's supposed to maybe try to take us back to EBITDA versus the smaller EBIT. Um, but uh, per GovTrack, all um, uh, ability to them to predict this, uh, there's only a 34% chance of it being enacted. Um, so in this regard, do you care about this? Uh, you do care or should care if you have a sizable interest expense, you're borrowing for capital or inventory, and then if you have significant capital expenditures coming, um, then definitely you should care. Um, next slide, please. So there must be an exception, and uh, there is. Um, uh, bigs versus smalls. Small business exception if gross receipts do not exceed $25 million under Section 448C. Um, however, full stop if you're a tax shelter or a syndicate. Um, so that 25 million actually was the original number in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Uh, for 2022, it was actually 27 million. And for 2023, it's actually going to be 29 million. So that just shows you a little bit about what inflation 
uh, has done uh, to some of the tax code provisions as they've, they've grown. Um, tax shelters and syndicates uh, will not get the small business exception under this. And for purposes of today's uh, conversation, uh, tax shelters and syndicates really are any entity that has 35% or more of its losses uh, being allocated to limited partners or limited entrepreneurs. So it is something that I've seen a couple times in my career, um, and you, you want to keep an eye on that because you actually might have uh, a limitation of interest expense that you did not expect because you thought you were a small business. Um, exemptions and opt-outs for this uh, are, are more than a few. Uh, if you're an employee performing services, if you're a farmer, utility company, um, and the biggest one is that you can actually opt out by making an election as a real property trader business. Uh, the second thing that you might be able to do here is really take a look at your interest expense and ask, is it really interest? Um, should it be part of inventory? Should it be part of a fixed asset? Is it some kind of other carried cost, which is really not interest? And, and can you reclassify it? If you can't do that, if you can't reclassify it and you can't meet one of the exemptions, you can carry it forward and you can carry it forward indefinitely. So it's not something that expires. It's just something that you would want to try to use. Um, next slide, please. For margin and investment interest, this is on the personal side or on the 1040 side, but sometimes this also flows through from, from your entities. Uh, you are also limited to deducting um, margin and investment interest against your uh, investment income. And generally that's defined as the interest dividends or excess net capital gains from the disposition of investment property. In this regard, there's something that you might look at um, as far as when you're doing your tax return or talking to your tax professional. If you have limited interest, um, if you have suspended interest expense, you can actually make an election to uh, reclassify your qualified dividends as net capital gains and release that interest expense. So that's something on our side as, as a practice, I also see probably five or six times a year where it is beneficial to actually reclassify qualified dividends as net capital gains and release the interest expense. Um, this does also happen um, sometimes at the business level uh, with a business that has investment income or uh, investment interest that is, is being suspended. Moving on to passive activities and basic pa passive activities, um, this is a, a thing that can change. So it, you can be fluid with whether you are active or passive. And it's one of those things that we also look at as far as the facts and circumstances test. And generally active is somebody who's materially participating in operations on a regular, continuous and substantial basis. Well, that's great. Um, and case law uh, will actually tell us kind of cases that have happened and how you would actually meet those factors. And then passive would be, be the opposite. Um, oftentimes people will have a situation where they will have passive activities and they will have losses that they can't, um, passive losses that they can't match against passive income. So folks will really take a look at this and try to change their income to match the loss that has been suspended. Um, here's an illustrative case, uh, Dr. Hardy, uh, physicians tend to end up in tax court seemingly more than anybody else. Um, but he was actually a, a minority partner in a surgery, uh, surgery center and got a new CPA. And the CPA started looking at his last couple of years of tax returns and actually determined that Dr. Hardy was passive. So he was actually going from active back to passive and made the classification in 2008 and did not end up amending tax return years 2006 and 2007 which were still open. So the IRS actually agreed that uh, Dr. Hardy was um, passive and not active, but they found that the CPA should have gone back and amended 2006 and 2007 and could not take the proactive approach just by making the classification for 2008. So Dr. Hardy ended up um, not being able to use the losses, probably had to pay uh, quite a bit of uh, interest. And I believe they, they were able to get the penalties um, abated. But again, here you can see the tax cases from 2006, 2007 being decided in 2017. Um, it, it, is, it is something that uh, you want to try to get a handle on and do right the first time versus going to tax court and uh, end up losing, even though you were actually correcting your determination.
basis limitations. Um, this is a year end item uh, that uh, you you want to look at um, if you in, as you evaluate how you did during the year. Do you have losses? Can you take those losses? Um, are you going to are you positioning your business for sale? Uh, what's your capital gain going to be? And probably also question here is who's tracking your basis? So the two big ones on the, the matrix I have here are tax basis and debt basis. Most K-1s or all K-1s by this time should have been brought to tax basis. They previously might have been on GAAP or a hybrid basis or a 704B book basis. And then debt basis is your basis in, in debt, meaning you're personally liable for that debt. Um, all of these things uh, at some level equate to you know, whether you're going to have a capital gain or whether you can take your loss or whether you could take a distribution uh, from the company without having a capital gain. Um, in this regard, the simplest way to look at this, uh, as far as basis goes, is how much did you invest in the company? How much money have you made and left in the business, meaning didn't take it out as a distribution, weren't paid cash? And how much money uh, have you lost or taken as a distribution? Because that's obviously going to reduce your basis. And then how much uh, are you on the hook on for creditors? Um, debt basis works great with partnerships. Debt basis does not work really well with S corporations unless you actually loan the money personally. So there's some nuances to debt basis, but it's it, basis is something that at year end and as you're going through the life cycle of your business, you want to make sure you know what your basis is and you want to make sure you know someone's tracking it. Um, lots of times you might have an outside basis uh, more than your tax preparer might be aware of. So definitely something you want to keep an eye on and something to look at toward year end. State income tax nexus and connect the dots. This is um, probably one of my, my favorite topics. Um, probably since 2018, states have changed their way of looking at state income tax nexus. Most states have gone to market-based sourcing versus cost of performance. Market-based sourcing lo loosely is who you are selling to, where your customers are located. Cost of performance is where you're actually doing the work. So it used to be in places like Pennsylvania, Maryland, cost of performance was the measure. And if everybody was doing the work in Maryland, then all the money that you were reported, uh, you were reported would be reported to Maryland. Um, similarly with Pennsylvania, uh, it was cost of performance and then switched to market-based. So now uh, states are looking at, are you serving people in our state? Are your customers located in our state? And there are bright line thresholds um, that come into play as far as uh, gross sales, and it is a state by state uh, measure. Registrations, however, can really um, trip you up because if you've gone into a state and registered and you thought you were registering for payroll taxes, you might have actually registered to actually file income tax returns in that state. Inventory is another item that can trip you up. Lots of states, California, for instance, if you have inventory in their state, they're probably going to expect you to file a tax return in, in their state, um, you know, even if you don't meet some other tests. Um, employees, number of employees and wages you're paying in the state can also end up being a factor. And again, a lot of this is a facts and circumstance tests. So if you have a lot of employees in one state and a bulk of your payroll is in that state, they probably think you're doing business in their state and that might subject to income tax uh, nexus. Um, drop ships, uh, people who are selling to the government, um, you, you know, where is the government located, right? Uh, it, they, they have offices all over the country. Um, and so you need to pay specific attention if you're doing those things and measuring where your income tax nexus is. Drop shippers, again, you're shipping it somewhere to your customer located in a certain state, and you might look at the bright line thresholds for sales and try to determine whether you have a filing requirement in that state or not. But it's not where you ship from, it's where the person is receiving um, the goods. And then as a sales tax indicator, you might find that sales, uh, sales tax travels a lot in the same circles as state income tax. If you're paying sales tax in a state, you're likely selling goods or market sourced to that state, and you would wanna actually probably file an income tax return in that state also. Uh, same as last year, is really a bad acronym um, with most accounts and tax folks. And it's really a poor choice when it comes to state income tax nexus. This is something that you really can't afford to not pay attention to. And if you're uh, in the process or going to sell your business in the future, um, there will be an examination of where you filed over the last several years and why you made decisions about where you were filing. 
So something that we really need to uh, pay attention to. And now for the new topic uh, and a topic that you may have heard about before or you will be hearing about very shortly if today's not the first time, uh, is the Corporate Transparency Act. This is a, a new act that is basically uh, about tracking and trying to prevent money laundering and domestic terrorism and the flow of funds through business entities um, that uh, are not really in operation. And again, they're, it's basically trying to track the flow of cash. Uh, the European, European Union and a lot of other foreign countries already have laws like this in place. So this is uh, FinCEN's, the Financial Crimes Network's um, a new law that uh, is being put out. And it really is an information report, not a tax reporting, um, tax reporting item per se. It is a very big net that is being cast uh, for the Corporate Transparency Act, and reporting companies are both domestic and foreign. And the domestic ones are as if you filed a with the Secretary of State or any similar office in the United States, you are a domestic reporting company. And if you're a foreign company and you're registered to do business in the United States, you are a reporting company. So there's really only two, um, but it is a very big net. You might notice that um, trusts were not mentioned as a reporting company, limited liability companies, corporations, but trusts, if they are registered um, with, with the Secretary of State, so business operating trusts, they would fall into this. Um, and it's also possible that your trust would be get wrapped up in this reporting if they have a beneficial interest in one of these entities. Um, so this is a wide sweeping net that's going to affect pretty much all small businesses and now we will get to the 23 um, exemptions. So uh, most of these exemptions are, are registered entities. The two that I've highlighted here are the large operating companies and inactive entities. So a large operating uh, company is determined to be uh, any company that has more than 20 full-time employees, $5 million of gross receipts, and a physical office in the United States. So if you are big, you will not have to file um, a corporate transparency report. If you are small and you don't meet any one of these other ex exemptions, you most likely will have to file a corporate transparency report. Um, you cannot aggregate, if you have a slew of companies, you cannot aggregate to meet the 20 full-time employees and the $5 million gross receipts or physical office in the United States. You have to um, you know, have that in one operating company. So, Aggregation is, is not an option. Inactive entities really have to be inactive um, in order to qualify in this. If you are a real estate shell company, you likely own assets and you will have to report even though you might not actually have any other activity other than just being a holding company. Um, entities assisting tax exempt entities and some of the other uh, insurance companies will be able to ex um, escape um, from reporting this. But again, it's going to take some analysis in order to determine whether you, you meet one of these exemptions. Initial reports um, to FinCEN and, and what that entails are going to be due by January 1st, 2025, if you are a company that has existed between 2024. Um, so anybody that has been in existence between one before one one twenty four, the report's going to be due one one twenty five. If you are a new reporting company in January, meaning you start business on January one twenty twenty four, and you're incorporated, you'll actually have ninety days, not thirty days, uh, as the slide says, to report. FinCEN is still actually tr changing um, some of the rules and regulations that go along with reporting. So it's something also that frustratingly we'll have to keep on, on top of as it changes. For, exist, for existing companies also, you cannot go on the FinCEN website and start this process until after 1-1-24. The website is, is not available to, to start this early, um, but you can start uh, gathering some of the data that they're gonna require um, now, which we'll get into in a second. So, what what kind of companies are going to have to report this and, and who, who's going to have to report? Um, the terminology here is a beneficial operating or beneficial ownership interest or BOI. And a beneficial ownership interest can be equity stock, voting rights, capital profit, convertible instruments, options or privileges, and then a catch-all, which is any instrument contract arrangement 
understanding relationship or mechanism used to establish ownership. 25% um, ownership is actually the test uh, for this and for, for the party being reported uh, as part of this report. Um, but if you thought that you could structure your company so that no one owns more than 25%, you still wouldn't have to, you would still have to report and going to the next slide, they would be looking at who has substantial control. So you have beneficial ownership, 25% or more, um, and then substantial control test, which if you don't have anyone who has more than 25% of an ownership interest, um, you're going to have to report at least one person who has substantial control. And it's kind of like a, it's not an and or an or, it's kind of like every everyone wound up getting reported under something like this. So you end up with a senior officer, uh, someone who has appointment or removal authority, which sounds like something you might see in a trust, quite frankly, um, an important decision maker, and then they also have a catch-all. So your beneficial ownership interest or substantial control is something that's going to actually make you end up going on that FinCEN um, report. Um, the other thing that you that gets to get reported here is after uh, 1124, anyone who's actually doing the application to FinCEN is going to have to be reported. So this would be the lawyer, the paralegal, the accountant, the secretary, whoever's actually preparing the report as an applicant is also going to end up being reported to FinCEN. Um, and in this regard, I haven't talked too much about what's going to be being reported to FinCEN. Um, but what you will be reporting is their name, their address, their EIN number, um, their uh, uh, ID, picture ID is something that I, I believe will end up having to be uploaded. You won't be able to use a post office box. It'll have to be a physical address. Um, and you'll have to do that for everybody who has a beneficial interest or has substantial control. Um, so applicants also, uh, will, it will probably end up being something that uh, law firms who are organizing entities do uh, because they will actually be filing um, the, the FinCEN uh, application or they'll be actually organizing the entity and then hopefully filing the FinCEN report, also reporting themselves as organizers or reporting the person who organized the entity. Um, and, and in this regard, there's really four things that you can do or I'd like you to think about doing now for your FinCEN compliance. And the first one is, is, is coming up with a company um, corporate transparency act policy, which probably would include who is actually going to be doing this reporting for us. Um, as many people and many companies are not going to qualify for an exemption. You want to um, come up with a policy and figure out who's actually going to do this. If you are a company that has several entities, um, you're going to want to do an inventory of your entities, all your LLCs and figure out, you know, can we streamline this? Should we dispose of some? Um, are some inactive? Um, and then, uh, you know, determine again, you know, what your structure is going to be going forward. And then finally, there is going to be something called a FinCEN ID, which is a separate registration, probably providing the same information that FinCEN would collect on one of these reports that then would be, would be tied to your uh, FinCEN ID that they would issue to you. Supposedly, the FinCEN IDs will help streamline this process and make the reporting easier. Um, the FinCEN ID, uh, one, one drawback that I've, I've read about is that apparently right now there is no way that once you're issued a FinCEN ID that you could revoke it or make it inactive. So um, if you wanted to be removed from one of these reports um, or you wanted to uh, take yourself out of the FinCEN reporting system, um, they do not have a mechanism uh, for doing that yet. And I believe uh, we're at my polling question. So when would a company created in 2024 need to file its corporate transparency report with FinCEN? A, 30 days, B, 60 days, C, within 90 days, or D, by January 1st, 2025? Drum roll and results. Very good, 54% got it right. Um, thank you, and I will now be turning it over.
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Michael. Thank you for sticking with us. We are at the home stretch, which is always exciting. Um, we are going to talk about some corporate income tax concepts, um, and uh, let's let's get going with our first topic. So, some something that James had touched on a little bit earlier. I'm I'm going to take this in a slightly different direction. Um, but this is something that has received an enormous amount of attention with our clients, um, folks who have come to us and just want to understand what this law is about, um, how to practically apply it, and uh, what it means, because as we're going to see, there's some interplay with uh, one of the other areas of tax law. So just to begin with, um, research or experimental expenditures um, should at this point in time, since the since this part of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was not effective until January 1, 2022, wasn't really on everyone's radar at this point in time. Certainly, we're almost two years ahead of that. Um, regardless of whether it has been paid attention to prior to this or not, um, it's something that should certainly raise a flag. Um, what used to be an opportunity is now something that we have to address more from a compliance perspective and treat it appropriately going forward. So what are, you know, how do you define research and experimental um, expenditures? So these are essentially at a very high level um, costs in the experimental or a laboratory sense. Um, think about in terms of in, in context of there's some uncertainty involved. So things that you're doing um, in a tech of a technical nature um, where we're not sure how this is going to turn out. Will this be successful or not? Will it result in a, an effective product that we can market? Um, the other thing to be mindful of is that software development costs are, and we're, we're really looking at internal software development costs um, for the company's own use rather than just something that's uh, directed at, at um rather than something that's directed at other uses. Um, and worth, this is also classified as r and &E expense, so it's covered under the new law. Now, as James had indicated earlier, prior to January 1 of 2022, when we saw experimental costs, research R&D costs, experimental costs, those, those items the, in the P&L um, were just left alone. They get to run through the P&L without any tax adjustment. Um, it, you know, stands as a good expense and reduces net income. Um, and to the extent that we had items such as internal software development that was typically capitalized on the balance sheet for, you know, what hopefully is a future asset, um, that asset was actually in a favorable sense under the old rules. Um, we could take advantage of an accelerated deduction and expense that, write that off. And over time, as, you know, as that asset um, was taken sort of into service or written off for financial reporting purposes, um, that asset disappeared. It was a timing difference, but nonetheless, um, it granted many of our taxpayers a very favorable deduction. So now comes the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. It's effective 1 1 2022. What are we supposed to do with these, you know, experimental, laboratory costs, uncertain costs, internal software development? These are all, I'm repeating those words because they should be in our minds and we should remain mindful of them going forward because they should be triggers for, well, this is something that I have to look at at a minimum and discuss with my tax preparer from an income tax perspective. So these, these items now fall under code section 174 um, and the rule that applies to them is they're required to be capitalized and amortized radically over a five year period, beginning at the midpoint of the tax year in which those expenditures are paid or incurred. Um, and that is for expenditures that are incurred in the US. So it's tied to where the research is conducted, where the research takes place. Expenditures that are attributable to foreign research outside the US is amortized over a 15 year period. Um, keeping in mind, this is an important concept. When I said that, um, that the amortization for income tax purposes over, you know, on these capitalized expenses um, begin at the midpoint of the tax year in which they are paid or incurred. That means that in year one, when these expenses are identified and capitalized, 
um, the taxpayer gets 10% of that pool of costs as a deduction. So year one, it's not five years. You don't you don't just divide the five years evenly. So in, let's say we have a million dollars of uh, R&D expenses that need to be capitalized under Section 174. Um, it's not, okay, there's a five-year amortization period. In year one, on my 2022 tax return, and also on my 2023 tax return, and for the next three years, I get $200,000 of deductions a year. That's not in compliance with Section 174. What it actually says is you get half a year's amortization in year one, which is $100,000, um, and then $200,000 for the next four years, and then $100,000 in the last year. Um, so that's, that's, a, uh, that's a technicality. So then if we take it a bit further and we think, okay, um, what is the definition of 174? These research and experimental expenditures that we're talking about. So we gave some buzzwords. We said we talked about you know laboratory use. We talked about the fact that it's experimental uncertainty. Okay, that's sort of nebulous. Um, what what does that mean? You know, software development. How are we going to apply this when it comes to 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 reporting it on our tax return appropriately? Um, so there's been a lot of discussion about that and different practical approaches that have been recommended. Um, to be clear, Section 174 is more expansive than the R&D tax credit that many of us are familiar with. And um, where that takes us is the following. While Section 174, um, you know, it speaks to many of the same types of expenses that are captured when we claim a R&D tax credit, it's much more expansive, it includes a lot more, and we have to look at it in a very detailed sense. Um, and the process that's recommended generally um, across the firms is categ categorizing essentially um, all of our you know, p and items um, into, into different buckets. And so what we do is we say, okay, if we know we have a line item in our financial statements, that's R&D, perfect. That's our starting point. So, we're good with that. What about everything else? What about our SGNA? So the approach that's tech that's that's generally um, taken when it comes to analyzing for purposes of figuring out, well, how much do I have to capitalize? Because I really my my objective as a taxpayer would be I don't wanna I don't want to capitalize um, anything if I don't have to. Um, but the the um, approach that we take is well, let's put it into four buckets. And we analyze each, each essentially each line item of SGNA and say, okay, is this R and E or not? Um, you know, category one, so to speak, could be these. Uh, this expense is not at all R and E. Category two, let's look at the next line that we have. Could be that that's a core part of R and E, which includes things like software development. A third category. Let's take our expenses and say, okay, perhaps this is incidental to R and E. Um, and that's something that we have to be mindful of as well. Um, and then category four would be sort of everything else where, well, it's not really clear whether it's core or incidental, and maybe I need to do some kind of allocation. Um, and so what we're building is, yes, you know, we're, we're, we're stereotypical CPAs. We're building a spreadsheet that says, okay, here's the trial balance. Let's put four columns together and let's place each line item of the trial balance in one of these categories. It's not R and D. Uh, sorry, it's not R and E. It is R and E. It's incidental, or I'm not sure. We need to think about it a little bit more. Um, and the result of that is typically some type of allocation where we say, okay, um, it would appear to me, doing some thought and math on the side, that a piece of that line item belongs um, to Section 174 and should be part of the total capitalized cost in that year. Um, some of the things, one other thing that we do have to be mindful of that has come up um, multiple times, and 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 uh, that was during the 2022 tax year, um, is that we have to include within this Section 174 um, basket that we come up with after doing our analysis, uh, you know, across those four categories and come up with a number, is that we don't just take book amounts, right? So we said our starting point is going to be whatever R&E is for financial reporting purposes. Well, then we look at everything else that's in the financial statements and we categorize it. Great, we've categorized everything. We have a, we have a total bucket of, these are our section 174 costs. 
there is one other step that we have to take, and that is to be mindful of any, well, we'll call it material, but really any tax adjustments that have to be um, applied to things like stock-based compensation, depreciation, um, section 170, 197 intangibles, um, you know, unit cap, things that could be attached to one of those line items that we are capitalizing under section 174. So those are things that um, could be an easy miss um, that you know, we've learned from implementing this uh, across our client base are fairly important. Uh, the other thing that you know we do have to we do have to watch out for is not to double count. This has come up um, quite often. Um, making an assumption. I've had clients that came to us and said, you know what, Michael? Um, yes, I get I get the idea. Starting point is you know R and E for financial reporting. I get the four buckets and how we have to come up with a number. What if I just use my software, use my um, GL software to create an R and E P and L for you? Is that good enough? Is that that's going to capture just probably more than what's required because I have everything tagged appropriately. That's great. Um, the thing that we have to do in that sense is A, we want to be careful not to just take that at face value because we don't want to overcapitalize because that's not in your best interest as a taxpayer. And the other thing we want to be mindful of is that oftentimes um, there are other tax adjustments that have affected these line items in that sort of r and &E p l that was created that we actually be able to pull out. So I'll give you an example. So um, if we have a PL um, that is focused solely on r and &E, and you know, we want to take that number and just capitalize it so that we simplify the process, um, if we've already added back or sort of disallowed certain accruals, um, stock-based comp from that p &L analysis, um, meals and entertainment, et cetera. And that's already been adjusted in a different part of our tax analysis in the income tax provision or the income tax return. Let's not double count it because again, we wanna be mindful of not overcapitalizing. Um, and just moving on to, I think what is the most, uh, before we get to the NOL, what I think is the question that I get the most often with respect to section 174 is its interplay with R&D. So we mentioned earlier, our starting, you know, we have we have two pieces of tax law. There's the R&D tax credit, section 41. We've got this section 174. They both look at the same pool of expenses to begin with. Um, we're focused on this laboratory technical uncertainty. We're focused on that type of expense. Um, and that is what is driving our R&D tax credit, and that's what's driving our Section 174 expense. Um, we do have opposing agendas, though, um, you know, opposing interests, opposing agendas. The R&D tax credit um, is something that the taxpayer wants the most out of. We always want the biggest tax credit we can find, but the application of Section 41 is very strict, okay? You can only take the credit if you meet certain very defined criteria. Section 174, however, is much more expansive um, and the IRS and the code section is looking to capture as much of these incidental or non-core r &E activities as they can to capitalize and disallow. Um, you're starting in the same place. They have opposing interests. One is a credit favorable to the taxpayer. The other one gets is capitalized expenses, um, which is a net taxable income increase unfavorable to the taxpayer, um, and they are mutually exclusive. That is extremely important to remember. The R&D tax credit, claiming an R&D tax credit is an election by filing a form within the tax return. Uh, Section 174 is a, is a requirement of compliance. That has to be done. So the question that I get asked is, okay, well, they're sort of similar. They touch on sort of the same expenses. If I just don't claim an R&D tax credit this year, can I just ignore this Section 174 thing? And the answer is no, because there are two different pieces of tax law and their application is very different. Okay, moving on there. Um, just wanted to touch quickly on NOLs as a refresher um, because when we're in when we've moved into this space of Section 174, a lot of companies all of a sudden have you know a tremendous amount of current income because they incur a huge amount of R and E expenses. So now you've got companies that have built up losses. Um, they're in the growth phase 
and they've built up at nano wells. But at the same time, now we've got some taxable income uh, because we have disallowed Section 174 expenses. So it's good to refresh our memory here. Um, I would start with the um, with the point of remembering that post uh, December 31st, 2017, under the TCJA, our NOLs that are generated after that time um, only offset up to 80% of a taxpayer's income, um, taxable income. NOLs from before that time can offset up to 100% of uh, the, the company's federal taxable income. It's important to separately track those. Um, keep in mind that the NOLs uh, that are generated after the 1231-17 period do carry, for, do carry forward indefinitely. Um, while it does have some, it does give us some thought around the impact to a company's valuation allowance for financial reporting. Um, the application of ASC 740 is still the same. Um, you know, if we're thinking about releasing a valuation allowance, if we're thinking about a deferred tax asset, um, it's still the same rule applies, um, and we have to. Um, we have to be mindful of the company's recent performance, which is significant evidence with respect to um, the company's uh, financial statements. Um, carrying on along, I think it's it's it would be, it's a it's related and a good idea to quickly touch on Section 382. Um, Section 382, as many of us know, is designed to prevent someone from acquiring a company just to use their NOLs to prevent NOL shopping, so that I don't have a you know a billion dollar company with hundreds of million dollars of taxable income, but because I bought some lost companies for no money, I don't have to pay any tax. So what 382 does, um, it limits the use of pre-change before the owner change NOLs, built-in losses, et cetera, whenever a significant stock ownership changes. Um, and we do some we do some math around that. Um, since we're running out of time, we can just flip ahead real quick. Um, and and essentially what, what we're doing um, is we're looking at a testing period to see if an ownership took place. Um, that test is performed by comparing an individual ownership percentage of all the 5% or more shareholders on the testing date um, to the lowest ownership percentage for those same shareholders at any time during the testing period. And if the sum of the pos these positive differences exceeds 50%, um, so we do some math, we determine an ownership change has occurred, um, Section 382 applies, we do some math around the fair value of the company, and the limitation to the NOL would apply, keeping in mind um, when there's a set Section 382 limitation in place, it only limits the amount of the company's taxable income in future years that can be offset by NOL. It does not impact the amount of NOL available, the amount that the um, the amount of the NOL that came along with or was carried along to the buyer. Um, new big and new bill, those are not net unrealized built-in gains and losses. Um, it's essentially that's the amount by which the fair market value of the company's assets before an ownership change exceeds or is less than their adjusted basis. Um, and you know the, Im the impact is uh, essentially, it, if you do have um, in a new big and net unrealized built-in gain, um, what it can do is increase your Section 382 limitation annually. So it gives you more NOL to use in the year and the reverse is with the new bill. Uh, and then just quickly to touch on um, guilty and foreign tax credit. Um, so guilty, as we all know, is the um, is is the active income that's earned by the foreign shareholders, um, and it often gives rise to a foreign tax credit. And some of the things that we've seen recently um, in that context, um, over the summer, there was a IRS notice that was put out that makes it easier uh, to claim a credit. So some of the final the final regulations. Um, that were issued in early uh, in in January of 2022 um, added a um, attribution requirement to claiming a foreign tax credit, which made it more difficult um, to claim um, to claim an income tax credit, uh, particularly with respect to at least in the context that I've seen it mostly uh, respect to non-income taxes. Um, and I'm thinking about royalty withholding taxes. It made it more difficult to claim it. Um, what that IRS notice essentially did was to reverse that attribution requirement, make it easier to claim a foreign tax credit um, and uh, and apply the rules of a foreign tax credit under the old rules, um, which is a welcome change to the taxpayers. Um, we would just want to be mindful of the fact 
that this has to be applied consistently um, with respect. If you do go with the old rules um, and you follow the notice, it has to be applied with respect to all foreign taxes paid in the relief year, um, including foreign taxes paid by CFCs um, for which the taxpayer would be eligible to claim the credit. All members of a consolidated tax group would have to consistently apply the credit, um, and you can't, um, you cannot apply the temporary relief to claim a foreign tax credit for any amount of foreign tax that's allowable as a as a deduction. It doesn't change the rule that you can either deduct um, a foreign taxes or claim it as a credit. Um, with that, I am going to thank everyone again. Uh, we've got, sorry, we've got one more polling question, and then I'll turn it over. So true or false, I can claim an R&D tax credit and not have any capitalizable Section 174 expenditures. We'll just give about 10 seconds. Should be pretty clear. I think we can wrap that up. And the results. So most of us got it right. Um, so uh, if you're if you're if you've got if you've got an R&D tax credit. Um, you have r &E expenses, you're going to have some capitalizable Section 174 expenditures. With that, I'm going to turn it back over to Andrew. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Michael. And thank you for everyone's attention during this presentation. We hope it was well worth your time. We are at the top of the hour. I want to be respectful of your time. If you have to jump off, please do. We will be following up with the recording of the video. There were several questions that came in. For anyone who wants to hang on, we're going to go through a couple of these. Uh, I'm going to grab, say, the, maybe the top three here. Uh, first question, can a grandparent that contributes to a grandchild's 529 take a tax deduction in Maryland? The answer is yes, provided they're the ones that open the account. They're a Maryland resident. If you're uh, married, filing jointly, you can deduct up to 5000 provided you put $5,000 in the account. Okay. Are there specific tax incentives related to technology investments that could benefit my small business before the end of the year? I'm gonna throw that out to our business tax folks. Are there specific tax incentives related to tech investments that could benefit my small business before the year ends? Andrew, I think one of the things we look at <clears throat> and tech investment is a pretty broad concept. Um, but if a person is saying, hey, I want to, I've got some, uh, perhaps an annual registration or licensing fee that I can pay before year end from a small taxpayer uh, on a cash basis, that could be a deduction. And also if you've got some hardware, perhaps, I don't know, maybe it's something cool like a 3D printer or something that's more, um, <clears throat> perhaps something you you uh, reevaluate on an annual or every couple of year basis like, redoing the server stack. Um, if you can get those things implemented before year end, and you can take that either IRC section 179 depreciation or the uh, bonus depreciation we talked about, those are some great tools where you could implement something that's really a growth driver for your business and get a tax benefit. Thank you, James. And let's get to one more here. I plan to sell some investments before year end. What can I do to minimize capital gain taxes on these transactions? A couple of things. Obviously, it's going to depend on your unique set of circumstances. The first thing is look for any losses that you might have. In, in other words, do you have any positions that are currently below what you paid for them? If so, you can sell that position to offset fully the, the gains if you have enough of those losses. You could uh, potentially take a look at, now this may not reduce your capital gains, but it would reduce your taxable income. Be sure you're maxing, maxing out retirement contributions, IRAs, and so forth. Those are pre-tax in most cases, depending on your circumstances. Uh, if, depending on where your income is going to be in 2024, can you wait until January to sell them? And then you have a whole other call it year and a half to pay the tax on that, depending on your situation. So those are some of the, the primary ones that come to mind if anyone else here in the room has an additional one. But those are some of the, the big ones uh, that we might look at to offset some of those capital gain implications. Uh, and if you want to talk about your own set of circumstances, feel free to reach out to us. 
We love what we do. We work very hard to make sure that we're not only meeting your expectations, but exceeding your expectations here at SCNH. Thank you so much for being clients of ours and friends of the company. We look forward to many, many, many more years of serving you the way you deserve to be served. So thank you for your time. And we hope to hear from you in the future. Take care, everyone.